Um, I'm Onno Willemsen. I'm heading up the uh, office segment for Philips and driving connected lighting for Philips Lighting. And uh, I will give a small intro on our Van Mauer's perspective and then I will introduce Owen Zachary Zacharias um, uh, for, uh, as from Delta Real Estate Development, um, who will take it over and uh, guide you through his ideas around this. So what we see in our environment, what's happening, is that the worlds and the needs and the trends are that we need more light. You see more needs around more light, more light points created around the world, more things installed to, to give people light. We want more energy efficient light. That means light is becoming more energy efficient, but also the need to become more energy efficient is growing. I will touch base on that a little later. And the light is becoming digital. And digital has huge advantages and opportunities where we'll talk about. And the vision of Philips is that we make lives healthier, better, sustainable through our, and we want to contribute from our lighting domain to that as well. And we drive that by meaningful information, the innovation. That means we want to pair our innovations through the business outcomes of our customers. So how do we do that? First of all, as you see here, we want to focus on the quality of light and the energy efficiency of light. And we do a lot of developments and investments to get to that point. But also, we do a lot of developments to uh, drive um, the, the experience that we can create in spaces to make people more energized, more uh, concentrated, or uh, 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 more collaborative. So these kind of things we are driving from our applications as well. But last but not least, we also focus on the business outcomes. So we really want to go in the dialogue with our customers. So what are the aim business outcomes for your business? And how can we, from our lighting domain, help you to get better in your business outcomes? So next to meaningful information, we see some really meaningful transformations going on in the marketplace where we would like to play with our partners and customers. One is that we see things going beyond the energy saving per se. After an energy neutral building, we can still invest to reduce the footprint of the building per worker, so to save on additional CO2 emission, reduce your carbon footprint, and these kind of things. So beyond energy, there's a lot of innovations we can do to make the building more efficient, to reduce your carbon footprint, but also to make workers more productive. Um, we focus on circular economy. I'll come back to that with a slide as well. How, that how we need to change as a company, both in our business models, as in the way we develop and the way we innovate. Last but not least, in order to drive these things, we see a really transformation needed and going on with respect to the business models we use. If you want to deliver the best result over the 10 years, you use our products we might need to invest a bit more upfront to get to the better end result, both on energy, maybe as well as your performances, like how you use an, a space. So to go from an initial cost model to an operational model really helps us to make the best investment decision upfront, rather than going just for a price point that is pre-spec'd. Um, so these are very exciting and uh, important transformations in the marketplace. If we look at the aspect of circular economy, if we keep going on as we do, we will need three planets by the time um, we reach 2050. Because the way we consume, the way we put natural resources out of the earth, yeah, we will reach a point that we need three planets to, if we keep going as we do. So there is a deep need for change on how we work with our products, how we reuse our materials. Um, you see the commodity prices are increasing quite in a rapid pace because it's short. So therefore the whole circular idea of bringing stuff back, reuse it and build new products to really let it circulate, that's a very important aspect. And that's not only to design it like that, but you need a complete business model around it. And we have some good proof points where we did circular projects with customers to drive that value and to make that business model work. And the savings that are potentially in there are also huge. So there is really a business case all over to do this. The business case is there, but we have to find the business model. So 
if we focus then on the third pillar, our business outcomes, you know, it's obviously the quality and the energy efficiency of products that have, that contribute to uh, a business case for the customer. But also if we leverage, as you can see here around in the booth, if we can leverage all the information we collect around how the space is being used, we can make better decisions and better advice on how to use an office. If we leverage the position of people in a space, you can advise them the nearest available meeting room and avoid traf traffic through the elevators and avoid travel time. That really helps to more optimally use your square meters, reduce your CO2 footprint, but also reduce your overall cost. Uh, last but certainly not least is the satisfaction of people, even on a reduced footprint, uh, the satisfaction of people and the, the productivity in that space. And there are a lot of technologies around us where we can partner up with in order to drive that productivity for people in an environment. So these are the business outcomes where we want to talk with our customers about to see how we can phrase an, a solution, uh, can phrase a business model, how we can make a financing model around it so we can actually start driving collectively that business model into successful pilots and projects. You might have seen him already here, it's an uh, Owen Zacharias, uh, Delta Development Group, uh, real estate development, really focusing on green and healthy uh, work environments, amongst others. And I really would like to give you the floor, Owen, and please share with us how you see um, uh, this development for real estate going forward. Thank you, Arno. So hi, everybody, my name is Owen. Let me see. Um, so as uh, it came through, as uh, it was presented, I'm a real estate developer. I grew up in the United States, but uh, I've made the Netherlands and Amsterdam my home for the last 10 years. And um, so we as a developer have been highly focused for the last seven, eight years on um, working together with an architect named William McDonough and developing uh, property around a, um, a sort of design paradigm called cradle to cradle. And for us, that is um, also something that, that helps to establish our business cases. And uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to show you one of the parks that we're working on today. And um, in order to get started, uh, I'm obliged to tell a little bit about myself, although I want to do it a little bit differently. So I'm a product of my history. And this is my father here. My father is a real estate developer from all was born in the Netherlands and lives in Washington, D.C. And this is my grandfather on my mother's side. And if we have anybody from the United States here, my, my grandfather was COO of a company called Levitt and & Sons. And Levitt and & Sons built all the Levitt towns in the United States. And he was the head of operations. So he was very much about producing this mass production model. So as somebody active in green real estate development, I've got a lot of urban sprawl to work off uh, in my karma bank. So, but this is, this development really sits in my blood. And um, this is something I grew up on construction sites ever since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And this is what I really knew what I wanted to do with my life from a very early age. And um, so this is now my cousin, Kurt. And uh, he is the owner of Delta Development Group. We have a US based company, a Dutch based company. And Delta really is our European branch. I work f under the Delta branch now. And um, this is a really interesting moment right here, and I'll share a little bit of a personal story. When I graduated from university at a master's degree in, in the Netherlands, it was the heart of the real estate crisis. And the uh, idea that I was going to go work for a bank and then go into the real estate sector from that was completely shattered. And I had no idea what to do, so like any good real estate guy, I said, follow the money. And there was still a lot of money going to Dubai and Qatar at this time, so I was going to go there. And I, my cousin one day called me up, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I've, I've got the world all figured out. I'm going to go to Qatar, and I'm going to be a millionaire by, um, by 30 years old. And he said, great. Maybe you need some pocket money while you're doing your interviews. And I said, yeah, that sounds fantastic. He said, well, we've got this project that we're working on called Park 2020. Why don't you come around and check it out? And so I came in, you know, fresh off of the books from, uh, from uh, my study. And uh, it was all about the, you know, what is the FAR and what is the, you know, price per square meter and what's the market carrying rate and the exit yields. And he just said, whoa, 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 whoa. Read this book 
and tell me what you think. And he slid across the table. It was the greatest soft sell I've ever received to date. He slid across his table, cradle to cradle, remaking the way we make things. He said, read this and tell me what you think. I read it in three days. I called him up and I said, is this really possible? He said, well, I've convinced a private equity developer to, or a private equity company to give us 350 million. We got the permits ready from the government, so we're gonna find out. I called up all my, um, my uh, interviews in Dubai, canceled them on the spot, and I'll tell you, it was the best decision I ever made not to follow the money. And I'll tell you why here. So when I started getting involved in this world, I can tell you that um, I think that I work in one of the greatest industries there is. Of course, I'm probably biased. But my ultimate question that I get to ask is, what kind of world do you want to build tomorrow? And for some kid that loved to play with Legos but never once built the thing on the box, on the cover of the Legos box, this is a very cool question to answer. And so, but if we look at what real estate used to be, it was very much a craft. Real estate used to be about skill. It was about art. It was about what we developed and delivered to our society as that society grew at a very slow pace. But if we look at how we build today, our world has at some point, and I think a lot of it has to do with after World War II and my grandfather's mass production model, that we are now in a very much about a mass produced model. And all of a sudden now, square meters become the driving indicator for decision making in real estate. And if you look at this, it is absolutely a faulty way to look at real estate development. It should, square meters should only be an end result, not an initiating starting point. And that's our position here. And we believe that engaging in this mass production model at a time where our world changes very, very quickly is like driving 200 kilometers an hour in the fog. Mistakes are, are really bound to happen. And the mistakes are transparent. We have uh, a lot of structural vacancy. In our home market of the Netherlands, we had the largest structural vacancy in all of Europe. Across the street from our development, there's about 50% vacancy. Uh, it's starting to pick up again now as the market improves, but our shocks and the peaks and the dips are becoming much closer together. No longer is it that 10-year cycle that you can set your watch to, and the dips are getting much, much more deeper. And the second is that this focusing in on the bricks and the mortar instead of the actual inhabitants drives us to really look for efficiency gains in terms of the property and not effectiveness gains in terms of what the property is actually for, which is people. If we're talking about housing, I'm talking about your families. If we're talking about schools, I'm talking about students. If we're talking about offices, I'm talking about workers. And is this really a great design for a building? I would say not. This is not something that if I'm a, a, real, a property investor, I look at this guy and go, hey, can I get two of these buildings? I wouldn't do that. So, how is it that we actually ended up getting so lost? And where did we actually start going wrong? And perhaps we need to start taking a step back to what real estate used to be about in order to really see where the real value is and where the right value is. Because this model right here, this has for a long, long time been driving all of our decision make making. For us, uh, I hear that there's a lot of designers out here as well too, maybe these, uh, this right here is a very quick and dirty calculation for how much is an investor willing to pay per square meter. And it's an inverse relationship between what we call a cap rate or a capitalization rate and how much we're willing to charge for rent. And that'll drive the value of the building and that's typically what we sell it for. But this decision right here shouldn't be where we start from. But the, and because the irony is, really, the more that we focus actually on efficiency and actually driving only a cost focus and a revenue focus, we're actually putting at risk those very same revenues that we are actually striving for. Because we're very short term now, we're thinking about a dump and run onto the market. It's very much about, I convince somebody that they need more square meters, and then I sell them for as much as I can. I drive the cost of production down as much as possible to increase my margin, hand you the keys, and like a locust, move on to the next building. So what that ends up doing is that actually puts the entire market, or if we're looking at risk, our beta risk, at a very, very, uh, yeah, disadvantageous point. 
And so we really need to actually look at things a little bit differently and maybe come back to a place where we used to, to find value. Um, and for us, we have uh, been, been uh, wonderfully uh, showed the, the, the model of cradle to cradle developed by the architect that you just saw on the last page and the chemist, uh, German chemist, Michael Braungart. But it's also a way for us to ensure quality. It's almost our quality insurance program. And I'll get back to quality assurance here in a second. And there are three main components. Anybody here that's familiar with the circular economy may recognize a lot in here. And that's because Bill and Michael were working with Ellen and her team, Ellen MacArthur, very early on on the creation of the circular economy. So what we have actually found, and we are very active in the CE100 and, and here speaking at conferences about the circular economy and cradle to cradle, we have actually found that the cradle to cradle is a fantastic design paradigm for the circular economy that we heard about. But the question should be, how did we actually end up losing effectiveness? And how did we drive efficiency? And let me get back to the quality assurance that we're looking for. Think about effectiveness is about doing the right thing. Efficiency is about doing things well. But if you're doing the wrong thing efficiently, you're efficiently wrong. So if you are Six Sigma, if you are wrong and Six Sigma, you are extremely wrong in what you're doing. The goal should be first, what is it to be effective? What is it to do the right thing? Where does value come from? And once I understand that, then get into how do I make my process to achieve effectiveness as efficient as possible. So what I'm looking for is not a reduction of my footprint, my carbon footprint, or a reduction of my kilowatt hours. I actually want to do a big beneficial footprint. So I think carbon actually gets a little bit of a bad rap, poor carbon, because actually we are primarily carbon. Carbon in plants, carbon in the soil is fantastic. Carbon in the atmosphere is a bad thing. So maybe carbon isn't bad, just the placement problem of carbon is. So instead of looking about a reduction, a carbon reduction strategy, I want to have a very in-depth biodiversity strategy that can actually sequester carbon and put it where it belongs all the while while looking at proper LCAs. Uh, so I need to have both sides of the coin there. Because a traditional sustainability standpoint looks at like this. We start, and we're very, we're very good at this, by the way, we take the bad stuff and we put it above the line, right? So it makes it look like, oh, this is bad, but we're bringing it down close to zero. The only person I want in my company looking like this is the accounting and control department, down and to the right. I don't want anybody in business development thinking down and to the right. I don't want anybody in sales thinking down and to the right. But of course, we actually, now we say, okay, I start with a carbon footprint and how do I get to zero? But is this really a great goal? Do I want to go out and tell my execution team, be zero? Just do what you can to get to zero. No. We want to say, OK, put it where it belongs. And of course, we want to pick low-hanging fruit to actually move the needle forward at a quick time. But while we're making these decisions, we need to make decisions at the same time that are increasing the positive aspects of the project, the profitability. So this is how I want the company looking, up and to the right. Profitability goes up, growth goes up, effectiveness goes up. And for us, effectiveness is about balance. It's about a balanced decision from, you may see this, we call them, or in cradle to cradle, they call them economy, equity, environment. This is very much people, planet, profit here. And as we run through these decisions here, we actually want to make a balance. So I achieve 100% when I'm thinking about economy, economy. Again, the American in me says, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. So I don't make a move on there. Over here now, I move to the people, and I ask a question about economy people. So are we paying people a fair wage, for example? Now as I move over into the people aspect, I'm looking at people money. So are men and women being paid the same wage? That type of thing. And here is straight people, people. So that's no slave labor involved in any of the production. We're very much about equitable treatment. And I can move around all of these different triangles and find balance in economy, balance in people, and balance in the environment. And when I achieve that, then I'm 100% good. And so this helps us structure the decisions that we make as our real estate developers. Because actually ignoring additional sources of value creation is simply put bad for business. Trying to reduce something is really actually 
I mean, it, reducing some kind of problem may be good, but it could be short-sighted. It should be about maximizing the benefits. And things like natural capital, I mean, this is really what is the value of, a, a friend of mine actually works on this in Botswana, and he says, what's the, walks, works with Botswana to say, what is the value of that one last white rhino that you have left that you've got three guys with AK-47s guarding on 365 days of the year? What's that worth to you as Botswana? And for us, it's very much a very practical standpoint. Trees are expensive, so I buy trees very small. I plant them in the undeveloped plots in my area development as they grow. Now I've got a bigger tree that I transpose into the finished developments, and now I've saved some money and actually upped the value of and, and had a great carbon impact. The same thing goes with the people, and this is for me very much where the most value lays. And this is a statement when we talk with CEOs, and that's who we always try and get to first, the CEO and the CFO. They understand this very well. And the reason they understand this is very clear, because if we look around our operating budgets, actually what we see is that about 90% of the cost of the firm is on the payroll, is on the people. About 9% are on their housing costs, and 1% is on the energy costs of, the, of an organization. But in a sustainability standpoint, and as a real estate, sta sustainable real estate developer, we quest and drive for this almighty kilowatt hour, and we are investing so much money in moving the needle just a small percentage, when actually it's only 1% of the value of the firm. So if I'm actually looking at this, first and foremost, let's all agree that people are priceless, so let's move upon that. However, I'm building an office park and I can track the average wage of the people at the park, so I do know that on any given Sunday, people are worth about 65,000 per, per person in the business park that I build. Each desk that we use to build them, think about the desks, the computers, the lighting, the carpet. This costs about 3,500 euros a year. And the energy price to actually light and run that workstation costs about 110 euros a year. So if I have a 10% savings in the energy bill, then I save them 11 euros. But if I have a 1% a positive effect on the people, I'm already paying six times their energy cost. So where do I want to put my investment into? If I'm looking to innovate and collaborate with my partner or my customer, I want to understand to them what drives value and have the effect here. So people look at me, I'm sure, and how many of you are thinking this right now? Yeah, oh, and okay, but natural capital and productivity, this is really vague and it's unaccounted for. And I don't ask you to put your hand up. If you're thinking this and if you've been thinking this already, don't worry. You're not alone. Most people think this way right now. But I really ask, is it necessary? Is it that it's too vague? Is it unaccounted for? Is that the problem? Is it intangible? Is that the problem? Because I'll, I'll bring to you now something that in terms of money that we're very familiar with. This is a balance sheet. And what do we find right here? Under assets, we classify intangible assets right on our balance sheet. So we already know how to account for intangible value creation. So ignoring people plan, it also becomes increasingly risky for the business models, and I'll show you why. We've been working with KPMG for quite a while, and KPMG is developing something called true value um, business models, and essentially what they found is they found they've looked at 10 drivers of sustainability, things like deforestation, energy and fuel, water scarcity, which by the way is a major problem right now, ecosystems decline, and essentially what they're saying is these are things that have typically been show, not shown up on the balance sheet or the profit and loss account of a corporation. These are externalities. So you can think that actually we privatize profit and socialize the risk, but these are things that anyways are externalities. But what we've ended up seeing now is that increased stakeholder action, the ability for us to link on Twitter very quickly. So Nike back in the day had these very troubling labor issues in Southeast Asia, it took a long time for people to catch up on that. But today, anybody can head into a factory with their cell phone and tweet about deplorable working conditions. If, you, if this catches on and you have millions of people tweeting about your working conditions, you change something. In Holland, we had ABN AMRO, the bank was nationalized. Just last year, they started handing out hundreds of thousands of euros in bonus to the people, to the top management of ABN AMRO, 
the Netherlands blew up on Twitter and said, this is absolutely unacceptable. And AB and AMRO actually took those bonuses away from those people. We also see resource scarcity and the ability to um, attract the, the inputs that we need to produce our products. And we see an enormous increase in global regulation. All of these three aspects are pushing these externalities inside the organization. And so the risk is really increasing if we are not providing ample attention to these aspects. So maybe we need a new set of glasses on how we're valuing property. And maybe that actually just actually maybe should start with our values instead of the cap rate and profitability. So what is value? And I ask you, and I'm just, I don't again need an answer or response or raise your hand. If I ask you what is value, what do you think? Now most people actually think this. But if I look in the Oxford Dictionary of what the classic definition of value is, it's the, the regard that something is deemed of worth or important. So it's a very different concept of what value is. And I'll outline to you the classic developer's model. Again, it's profit driven. Here comes some metrics for us. It's about how many square meters can I produce. Now I've got a strategy to do that. I'm going to produce as many as I can for as cheap as I can. My tactic is at the behest of the poor general contractor who I'm going to squeeze as much as possible to bring down his cost. And then hopefully I achieve my goal, which then allows me to benchmark my profitability against the market. This may also be a classic sustainability way. Think about BREEAM and LEED. I benchmark my BREEAM and LEED against everybody else's BREEAM and LEED. But at Delta, we've looked at this another way. We actually start with our values. What are our values? And from our values, they generate a set of principles. These are the rules of the game. From here, each project derives its own vision. This actually gives a project its soul. And I can tell you that this really generates buy-in from the community, from the tenant, from the investor. This is a very successful model. And what you see is that I can still get to the, all, the, all of these aspects, except at the end, I'm looking to generate value. So I want to go from values to value. And then as an entrepreneur, it's up to me to place value in the market for the right price point at the right time. And what's interesting is this is a great collaboration model because this breeds confrontation. If I start at profit and all of a sudden now things go wrong, and in real estate development, budgets are always tight, schedules are always too short, if something goes wrong, then I draw a line in the sand and I go to my customer and I say, hey, how do I maximize my profit and take a little bit from yours? But if we started from our values, then we're standing at the same side and we're saying, what's the problem and how do we solve that together? So now I'm obliged to tell you a little bit about my project. It's about 92,000 square meters. You can read the data right over here. And um, it's about 5,500 in facilities. We're well on our way to completion. And uh, it's close to Schiphol. Um, but these are the stats that I'm most proud of. It was realized in the heart of the worst economic crisis that Holland had ever seen. It's renting at a market premium of right now about 29%. And when I mean 29%, I mean 29% over that building and that building. So location, location, location. These are other Class A buildings. We're renting at a 29% premium. We require zero concessions in order to obtain commitment in a long-term lease agreement. We have no problem financing our projects. And our exits are, pro are plus and minus about 40 to 45 basis points outperforming the market exits as well. So I say this only because it is profitable to engage in this way of development. Delta has always been a quality developer. Quality from the very inception is always set in our blood. So we have always, if you want to take a look at Michael Porter's, I'm a strategist by training, so I, Michael Porter is something I always first flock to. Um, but our model has always been about product differentiation across a broad target. So it's always about a high quality model. We're never going to compete on a low cost model. That's just not who we are. And our broad target implies that we're active in commercial, residential, retail, logistics, hotels. So this for us, this quality perspective, played very well into who our identity was. And this was a model, this is not mine, this is from William McDonough. We were shown this in the very beginning and we were asked to have a little bit of faith. Let's say we start here today and we want to go someplace. Maybe we can all agree upon that we want to go to a better world. If we all don't want to go to a better world, then I don't know what we're doing here. But So let's say we set our flight path up and it's a pretty linear one. If I look at an eco-efficient or traditional sustainability model, it looks as so. What you'll notice here is an 80-20 rule happening. 
So we picked the low-hanging fruit, and you see very rapid gains in the performance right here. All of a sudden now, it becomes much more expensive to, to get those additional gains, and something flips, and then we see 80% of the investment for 20% of the gains. And the law of diminishing returns tells us as we approach 99.99%, we can never move the needle anymore. So you'll never really reach zero anyways. So what we looked at was an effective, an effective model, and the effective model looked like this. So we, of course, had to reinvest. We had to invest to learn what it was to be effective. Now, while we still picked the low-hanging fruit that enabled our trajectory to go up a little bit, but once we learned what it was to be effective, then we got efficient in producing effectiveness, and our gains really shot up. That was when we really saw the gains. And the difference then between those two is what we've seen to be market leadership. Here's actually how we, how we ended up doing. This is the real Park 2020 situation. The market was already established. We already had a production cost, what the market could carry in a price per square meter production cost. We had the market de determining what the rent per square meter was, and this cost and rent would result in an exit yield, or what we could sell the building for, price zero. So then the crisis hit. And everybody all of a sudden said, oh, I'm going to go on my costs, and i got to drive down my costs as much as possible. For us, we did the opposite. We invested more in our company in quality. So when the crisis hit, we invested. We had to optimize the labor in our own company, but we had still invested. And what that ended up doing was, of course, we actually had a little bump out in our production cost. But this production cost was offset by a higher quality, which could generate a higher rent, which produced exit point number two. And then that's what it is to be effective. It cost us a little bit more in the beginning. It took us about two buildings to learn how to do that. Then we focused on the efficiency of our process. And now we could drive down the cost per square meter production and hit that same quality level and generate an even higher rent, which increased the then exit price, and for us, again, as a high-quality developer, it's not low-cost volume, it's high-quality margin. So this, for us, the effective margin is what we actually made a higher profit on, and that's that 40 basis points outperforming the market, which is significant in our business. And cradle-to-cradle -cradle was the way that we actually ended up doing that. And for us, we, uh, we set out very strong goals in the beginning. We backcasted. We set our, our, our sights on water, energy, materials, and biodiversity. And we said, what would 100% good look like? Remember these decreasing up the bad and improving the good? We set our targets at the very end, our big, hairy goals. And then we backcasted over OK, and that allowed us to get to step one and then step two. But then we had a very clear plan over, I make this investment at that time in this uh, strategy and then I improve the total footprint in the end. And because we are building campuses, we get to centralize a lot of our systems. We centralized our water and energy. Here's what the water system looks like. We have a nice, beautiful Dutch canal here, and all of the gray water is separated from the black water. It's first sent to a natural heliofiltration. In Dutch, we call it a helifita filter. And here, um, all the buildings are actually then coming, and then it goes from the Helefita filter into a water retention pond. This is then sent back in the buildings or sent to irrigate the site. Once it's in the buildings, it goes back into the Helefita filter, retention, building, so on and so forth. The energy as well, so we're able to shift all of our heating and cooling loads across the buildings. We centralized a hot and cold storage system, which cost us about 5.6 million euros to build. But actually, what's ended up happening is now because we centralized the system, our economies of scale and scope have actually allowed us to reduce the technical room space by 3% in each building. So at 210 euros a square meter, that's actually a net profit after discounting the cash flows of 1.8 million euros. So economies of scale and scope on the area. And then our biodiversity plan was thought forth right from the beginning. It's all about creating pocket parks. Actually, what we also did was we worked a lot with local research institutions. We found that there were four critically endangered species of butterfly in the Harlem Amir, and we thought that that was terrible. So all of our landscaping program, all of our packages are all big, beautiful targets for these four endangered butterfly species, and we've linked with local 
uh, elementary schools so they can have a butterfly study curriculum. And now we have little kids running around the park studying butterflies. It's actually really nice. It, because, yeah, that, that reminds us what this is all for, linked to the kids, because that's what we're doing all this for. So I'll, link, I'll tell you about our value propositions. Uh, one is about optimizing the quality per square meter. Of course, we want to talk about efficiency and energy and optimize the carrying costs of the asset. Productivity is a, a big one for us. And then we're looking at residual value of building materials. And I have another hour presentation on each one of these, but I've elected today to talk to you about the people. Because these are the most important people at Park 2020. And so, so there are some recognized influences on productivity. There's a great World Green Building Council study. We also link with individuals like Julian Treasure. If you've never heard of this person, Google him. He is incredible. One of the world's foremost acoustics professionals I could ever think of. All I can think of in here is what Julian would think with these acoustics. He would be losing his mind. But um, so these six areas right here are where we also really put our focus into and we link with institutions, universities, uh, we do the studies, we work with private organizations, uh, leasemen from the UK, and we make all of our, take your pictures, go right ahead, and uh, we make all of our clients also partners of ours as well. And so for air quality, this is one of my favorite CEOs I've got to meet, he's a landscape architect, and we talked about him, uh, how do you bring the landscape actually inside the building, and what does this do for air quality? So, we looked at the following, the CO2 levels, humidity, temperature in terms of Celsius, and we looked at volatile organic compounds in terms of formaldehyde, benzene, rayon, ammonium, alcohol, and fine dust particulates. And the research method was as follows. We did a first a deep study on the outside air, what's the clean air outside. Then we did our office without plants, and then we did our office with plants. And actually, just a little bit of background, um, you see some studies out here that start to say once you're reaching 10 parts per million of VOCs, there are some pretty problematic things happening. Our guys say about 15%, but in that range is where you want to be. You definitely don't want to be over 15%. And the reason is because in the short term, these can lead to things like dry eyes, headaches, skin irritations, decreased attention. But in the long term, they can have some pretty damaging and actually some pretty alarming effects. I don't want to put any kind of scare tactics to you, but if we're, these can happen. And here's the results, right? We have a lot of engineers, and they always say all, all the time, because I'm someone that works very much on intuition and, come on, let's go try something new. And they say, hey, Owen, in God we trust, everybody else brings data. And so here's the data. The reality is, is that our office was, without the plants was actually quite problematic, 37 parts per million in terms of VOC. And I have no problem telling you that because it's all about me being honest and transparent in order to improve. The low point was at 11, and that gave us an average of about 17. Now look at the difference. With the plants, these were much, much lower. What you see is that even the um, max point of the max point of with the plants was lower than the average level of without the plants. So we do see that plants do have an effect on cleaning the air. So here you have, again, those VOCs. Here you have some of the effects of those VOCs. And NASA actually has fantastic studies that looks at different plants and says that these plants have the effects on these types of ailments. And it's a public study. And actually, if you want chrysanthemums, put chrysanthemums in your office. Those will take care of almost just about anything, unless you have allergies to the chrysanthemums then I didn't tell you to do that. So then we also want to talk about thermal comfort of the building, and it's very much about also the open and closed side and the on-site orientation of our buildings on the site and providing thermal controls. Actually, this is the hot and cold storage. We use, um, we use um, concrete core activation. We store the heat and cold in the concrete and in the steel of the buildings. These are, cold, these are tubes of hot water for the ground, we do cold water in the ceiling, and essentially the cold air will fall, the hot air will rise, and that's how we heat them. That's a very slow system. So at each workstation, we need to be able to bump the degrees two or three degrees per worker. Natural daylighting is a very, very important aspect. All of our buildings are centered around huge atriums. If I show this to my American colleagues, they go, oh, what a waste of square meters. But actually, this is really an extremely efficient building in terms of the cost per unit per square meter. What we look at is a ratio of the facade 
to the lettable floor area because the facade's the most expensive part of what we build, and the lettable floor area is where you earn the money, and we're at about 93% in these buildings. So that's a very, very efficient earnings model for us. And lighting is na of not only natural lighting, but artificial lighting is very important, and we work very closely with Philips, which is why I also get to stand here today and talk to you in Frankfurt. And, um, and I like very much that they, they introduced us to the idea of light can do cards. So it's not only about, again, the, the energy reductions of LEDs versus TL5s, but it's what does your product do to influence the people? So what if light can make open spaces more versatile, so improve the flexibility and the adaptability and the agility of the spaces? What if light and sound can actually work together to benefit the acoustics? You see them as the, in the entrance point to the Philips stand here. So you see them right here. So actually what you start to see now is how do I make one euro capital investment to have two effects on those productivity aspects? So noise and acoustics is very important for us. Again, we brought in Julian Treasure. He has fantastic TED Talks that says architects should design with their ears. And... Um, and essentially what we end up doing is we built this sound kind of um, yeah, buffer in between the public zones and the private zones. Our customer came to us. This is for Plantronics, uh, the world's leader in uh, headsets and wearables. Actually, they did the, the headset that, what is it, when they jumped out of the moon on the lunar landing, they said, well, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. They said that through a Plantronics headset. Greatest marketing uh, campaign I've ever seen. And, um, but they told us we want to build an acoustic temple. So we didn't know what that was. And then biophilia for us was really important also. So this is the inside of our Bosch Siemens building, again at Park 2020. These plants are again chosen to, for their abilities to clean the air. And what we do is we actually then bring cool, uh, clean air through the building every morning. Because it's an atrium, it'll heat up a little bit. These are then filtering the air along with the, the other air filters that we bring in. We like sheep's wool instead of carbon filters because we find them a little better. And then we create a pressure vacuum up in the area here. So as that hot air will rise, it'll actually get sucked through the building into all the workspaces. So every morning when the employees show up, they have, we've refreshed them with a completely clean air in the building. And then we want to optimize the layout. And this is really about working together with your client in, in the in the old days of about five years ago, we talked about het new of Erica or the new way of work. But actually what we find is this is almost a new form of tailorism. People with me, uh, my, my doctor says I've got ADD. I call it, I'm enthusiastic. But uh, for me, these types of open layout offices are a nightmare because if I hear somebody talking, I get distracted and then I'm 15 minutes before I'm back in my groove. So actually what we ended up doing is we worked very much in a different way now. We work in something called the, the four C's, contemplate, concentrate, communicate, and collaborate. And we now engage with our clients. Here you see um, the function is sales, HR, finance, legal, procurement, logistics. And we ask them, how much time do you spend in concentration, collaboration, contemplation, communication, and how often do you work from home? And what we can get here is a very clear picture of each department's spatial need, specifically characterized for their work. And then our interior layouts look like this. So we design our buildings from the inside out together with the client. And they're very much designed around their work topology and their function. And then we clad it with a beautiful cladding. And then we also provide areas where they can also gain in. What you'll see here also, you'll see very, you see the six chairs. We also provide very few four-top tables. And that's very well thought out because if you, if you provide a lot of four-top tables, we'll always go with the same four. Let's pretend that you are all my friends. I, we actually do know each other from past interviews. But I will always go to lunch with you four, and I'll sit around and talk about the same stuff. But if we provide six, the opportunity that two new people have to join on my conversation is an opportunity where serendipity and interaction can happen around food. So that's why we have almost no four top tables in our lunchrooms. And we believe in one more, and that's experience creation. And I can't put a smile on the balance sheet, but it's one of the most important things that I've got. And so we have, uh, this is our farmer, his name is Hans, 
And Hans, we actually took the undeveloped land and we built a social farm so people with distance to the labor market, maybe they have slight handicaps or they've made some poor decisions and they're transitioning back into society. Um, they come and they can actually deliver a contrib contribution to their community and get paid for it. And Hans actually works together with Chef Nico to produce all of, so this is real farm to table. In fact, our farm is the undeveloped plots on our construction site and it's all producing uh, the daily meals that are at the restaurant. And this is also our butterfly garden. Here you see us growing our trees for, to be used on the future locations. And this greenhouse provides a, a connection between, uh, between the uh, buildings, but it's also just a real fantastic place to come work. And creativity and design is also really important for us. This is a travel agency that travels primarily to the, to the Far East. So we built them a Chinese lantern and it glows at night. And it's a Beamer room for 360 degrees because they're an IT travel agency, so they're very far from their customer. So they want to bring people here and show them videos. So let's say we're traveling to Ethiopia. You will come in and you're surrounded by the sounds and the colors and the, the sights of Ethiopia. Then they take you out into the restaurant where you're smacked in the face with the smells of Ethiopia because they're cooking for you there. And then they have on-site travel doctors. And of course, they have lots of tables where you can book more online vacations because they're about five grand a pop. This is a uh, travel luxury provider. But what you also see is that the identity is also put into the facade here. The theme of the company is colors of the world. So the colors of the world are showcased on the areas that they travel through the glass. We also have here FIFA Pro. This is the players' union for FIFA. If this is not FIFA, these are all the lawyers that handle the, the players. And something that we wanted to do here was actually we know that things that we touch will be absorbed through our skin. We also know that we lose magnesium in our sweat. And professional athletes tend to be magnesium deficient because they work out like maniacs. So we made all of the door handles, all of the metal railings, everything metal that these players touched out of magnesium instead of aluminum because we wanted all, everything that these athletes touch to make them a better athlete. And these types of things I can't put into a balance sheet, but this type of detail, the six top tables, these are things that help sell buildings. It's nice that the price per ton of magnesium is actually cheaper than aluminum, so the business case is nice and tight too. But hey, it's about the, the attention. And uh, the next one that we also had, these are heavy pictures, is Blue Water. The whole uh, tile facade here is designed to be deconstructed. It's all cradle to cradle certified. And this is Blue Water. It's an engineering company based on the water. So we chose the palette of colors to be sand and seashells to be reminiscent of the company inside. But if the next company comes in and their colors are black and red, then we can actually trans take the tiles off and put new colors on. And I would be, again, what I want to say here with these smile stories that we tell is that be, too, be careful, of course, in God we trust, but everybody else brings data, but be careful in just relying on statistics. You have to also feel this thing and you have to feel your client. Providing productive, healthy workspaces is understanding just what it is to be human into a way. So, you know, I can manipulate statistics to show you anything I want, pretty much, but you can't, I can't manipulate people that actually love their building. Bosch Siemens, we stay very close to the PA of the CEO. And when Bosch Siemens moved in, we asked him, how's the building going? How are you doing? And the PA said, we're sending 25% less emails in this building than we were in our last building. So that was really the start of our investigation. And yeah, and, and I don't know, you know, that's productivity. I don't know what it is in their, their company turnover or in their meetings, but there it is. So it's not all about data and statistics. Sometimes it has to be fun too. So I want to talk about our process because I work in a very archaic industry. It's not much different than what it was way back when. It's, a, it's, a, it's an industry that is not only adverse to change, at times it's petrified of change, the construction industry. And we get very smart in our new techniques but we, and new technologies, but we keep doing things the same way. And so how did we shatter this production model? Um, and I'll show you that right now because collaboration is really important. This is a traditional collaboration model here. We sit at the top of the food chain and we dictate what goes on. 
I'll, I'll pull a client in, and maybe the client will have a say at what they do. It's, tend to, it's usually given to us in a uh, program of demands or a, um, a, um, a spec, um, a tender offer. And then I'll pull in a, a several general contractors and say, who can meet my request for proposal for as cheap as can? Whoever's cheapest, they'll win it. Then I'll pull in an architect and an interior designer. I'll probably pay them a little bit more, but not much more. And then I'll have a whole slew of advisors to help me bring the building down uh, as energy efficient as possible. Underneath that sits the subcontractors. I have no idea who those people are. And then under that sits the suppliers. And all the way down the supply chain, power moves downhill. It's driven from the top down to the advisors. Again, architects' fees are under scrutiny. The GCs are squeezing the subs, and the subs are squeezing the suppliers. It ends up being a zero-sum game, and transparency is non-existent. The incentives, the incentives are really to wait as long as possible. And what ends up happening is all the way down the supply chain, I've got a technical specifications. Everybody's trying to hit the lowest level of quality for the cheapest price. They're just trying to do the bare minimum for as cheap as possible. And that is not helping my quality of the building. This is actually what I mean when I say when we focus on the, the exclusive profit and revenue, we actually make those profits actually riskier. So the result is a culture of mistrust. The GC is looking for alternative oppor opportunities uh, for earning. Usually that's done in his purchasing. And this is what happens with the closed book policy. I tell him, here's 100,000 for your lighting. He says, okay, I got 100,000 for my lighting. Um, and then he goes to all of his buddies and he says, hey, can you do it for 80? And then there's 20 left over and I'll kick 10 back to you and I'll keep 10 for myself. Or, yeah, I see laughter, but this really happens. But it's unbelievable. Or I'll give you a fishing rod or take you on some kind of fishing trip if you do that for 80 instead of 100. This really happens. And I end up paying more for a cheaper product. Quality is not maximized. Innovation is not even really considered important. It's a nuisance. And sustainability is really expensive. And the result is probably one of the, one of the most, yeah, self-loathing business models I've ever seen from the general contractor. If they make 3.5% uh, revenue or, or vinced, then they're doing a great job. But the potential failure costs that they're on the hook for are about 14 to 18%. So it's massively three and a half to maybe even five times the earnings model. What possesses you to engage in this type of business model? I would never say that. So, and the tenant and the owner bear the effects because the lower quality equals higher maintenance and a worse off exit yield. So this is our business model right here. It's about as lean as we can get. We have a board of directors where the general contractor, the developer, and our equity investor are all equity partners in the project. The CEO of each sits on a decision-making board and they meet once a month. We also see the client, the GC, and the architect as, a, as partners as well. And then right underneath us are those advisors, subcontractors, suppliers, knowledge partners like universities, and the interior designer. But this allows me as a developer to link directly with Philips and say, I need this type of solution. Your budget is 100000 Give me your highest quality. Because no one's trying all the way down that supply chain to squeeze out the money. And it's, it's pretty intimidating for the general contractor because their extra earnings model, that 3.5%, is earned on that purchasing. So it's a hybrid method where leadership comes from the top, innovation comes from the bottom, and they meet. But innovation is also very quick to the developer. We know, Philips knows more about light than I could ever hope to know in all of my days because you're there with it 365 days of the year. So I just need to know who the best lighting provider is or who the best carpet tile manufacturer is. We also work with Desso, who you guys are working with. And we say, what is the latest innovation coming out of the market? So the characteristics so that risks and rewards are shared, they're openly discussed and shared. The developer remains in the first position, but our relationship with the architect is very much closer to a partnership, and the client is intimately involved. Other team members are contracted out, but the turnover is very low, so we want to keep these people involved in all of the projects, because we all learn together. And then our project teams are formed with weekly meetings. The result is to create a culture of trust, 
Contracts are very clear. Profits and risks are shared. Clients are directly engaged from the onset. Quality is maximized. Margins are increased and failure costs reduced. That's how we sell it to the general contractor. How can I bring your failure costs down? He says, my earning model, I need 3.5%. We say, okay, you get 4. But no more discussion. I want open book calculation, and I want to know everything that you're buying. And the tenant's happy. Carrying costs are reduced. And then we went out and we found all of these companies and we made them partners of the project. These were all material manufacturers so that we could learn from them and innovate with them. And this one is, it looks intimidating, but essentially our integrated supply chain is about motivating through contracts, then getting our logistics nice and tight. This is where we bring the suppliers in. Then that incorporates the need for more inf information. And then we all train everybody together, and we train them for free. And so the last slide that I have is actually, this is characteristic of, of in the United States, it's called a primary, uh, an IPD, initiatory integrated product development. And, but there is one aspect that drives where you have to start with this, and it's right here. What is your intention as a developer? And that's where I wanted to start, and that's where I want to end. And I ask you all, what is your intention? Because you can have the bottom or you can have the top. So what is it you want to do? And let's close our eyes and then open them, roll up our sleeves, and get busy. <laughs>